please help me welcome our speaker for the morning. Richard Ellis is professor of astronomy in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at University College London. And from 2000 to 2005, he was director of Palomar Observatory. Professor Ellis has conducted distinguished work in observational cosmology with an emphasis, mo emphasis most recently on questions related to the growth <clears throat> of large scale structure in the universe, to the origin and evolution of galaxies, and to understanding the role these galaxies played in the epoch, epoch of reionization, the period in the history of the universe we refer to as the cosmic dawn. Professor Ellis is also concerned with devising and organizing the application of modern technology to astronomical instrumentation. Notably, in 1995, he served on a committee whose proposal led to the design, construction, and deployment of the James Webb Space Telescope. And at the end of our discussion, Professor Ellis talked to us about his new book titled, When Galaxies Were Born, The Quest for the Cosmic Dawn, which is to be published in November by Princeton University Press. So again, Professor Ellis, welcome to the Greenway Talks online at Palomar Observatory. Thank you for the taking, thank you for taking the time speak with us today. We'll take questions at the end. For that reason right now, I'll ask everyone, at least those who have come in over the internet, to turn off their microphones. And with that, Professor, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. So let's uh, see if we can get this to work. Okay. Um, yes, I see. I, I can see your presentation. Okay. And let's hide the video. Code. And then hide the floating media controls. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Right. Well, it's uh, for me, it's an amazingly nostalgic time to come back to Caltech and, and Palomar. Um, I've had a great observing run here. Thank you, S Steve, for that very kind introduction. Um, it is a very exciting time in uh, astronomy at the moment because, of course, of the successful launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. What you see here is the first deep image uh, that was taken, uh, that was uh, publicly released and announced by President Biden in, in uh, literally only uh, two months ago, early July. And um, it is a image, uh, I hope you can see my cursor, let's see. Um, it is an image of a cluster of galaxies, the, uh, the white, objects are the members of the cluster, each is an individual galaxy, uh, and the uh, red objects which have distorted shapes are background galaxies that have been, um, let's see if we can get rid of this, that have been um, distorted and magnified by this foreground cluster. Uh, so this a uh, spectacular image was uh, released uh, in early July to demonstrate uh, that the uh, universe, that the James Webb Space Telescope uh, is working well. I don't know why this keeps coming back. People keep asking me to admit them, so I will do that. You know, let's go back 100 years. Uh, some of us are approaching that time. Um, you know, the universe was thought to be just the Milky Way galaxy, and here we are in the solar system, two thirds of the way out. Uh, then here, of course, 
Uh, we were talking about Mount Wilson just a moment ago. Uh, Edwin Hubble demonstrated uh, that the Andromeda spiral uh, was outside of the Milky Way by looking at the, the light curves of uh, pulsating stars whose luminosities we understood from studies of similar systems in the Milky Way. So at a stroke, the universe became fantastically larger uh, as viewed by humankind. Um, the tools that we use today are the big ground-based telescopes, uh, the twin Keck telescopes in Hawaii. Of course, Caltech is privileged to have access to those. Uh, the European Very Large Telescope in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And of course, NASA's big programs, the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, the now uh, finished uh, but highly successful Spitzer Space Telescope, which was operated out of uh, Pasadena, and the new kid on the block, the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. And I'm going to involve in my talk uh, a little bit about the history uh, of all of these telescopes. Uh, but of course, you've come here primarily to hear about the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. So let me tell you something about um, the expansion of the universe, which is going to be crucial to understand how we address the topic of my talk, which is uh, the cosmic dawn and the birth of the earliest galaxies. Now, you probably know that the universe is expanding, but it's incorrect to think of the expansion as the galaxies moving as projectiles through space, pre-existing space. The galaxies themselves are not actually moving very much. Uh, it is mostly space that is being stretched. And I know the concept of stretching of space uh, is difficult to uh, grasp, uh, but the bottom line is that um, we imagine a galaxy shown here, if you can see my cursor at the bottom here, see we keep admitting people, um, sending a light ray uh, to us over here. And as that light ray travels towards us, it takes such a long time to reach us because of the scale of the universe that space itself has expanded. So by the time the light ray reaches us, the universe has expanded and the wavelength of that light ray uh, has expanded as well. And we measured that in terms of the redshift. And um, that redshift is the ratio, uh, observationally, it's the ratio of the wavelength of the received light compared to the wavelength of the emitted light, minus one. But it's much more fundamental than this stretching of the wavelength because it's a measure of by how much the universe has expanded since the light ray left that galaxy. And uh, if we have um, a model of how the universe is expanding, then we can convert that redshift into what we call a look back time. We can say at what epoch in the past we are studying the light from that galaxy. A redshift of zero uh, corresponds to today. That's why there's this minus one here. A redshift of one would mean the wavelength has doubled, and we're looking back about 8 billion years into the past. And a redshift of, say, 10 would correspond to the very early universe, when we're looking to when it was only a fraction of its present age. So over the last 30 years, largely due to the partnership between telescopes like Keck and Hubble, we've traced the history of galaxies over about 90% of cosmic history. So here are two familiar galaxies today. This is an elliptical galaxy. This is a spiral galaxy with a, uh, with a companion, the Whirlpool galaxy, Messier 51. Uh, if we go back to when the universe was only 5 billion years old, you can see uh, that these two galaxies resemble elliptical galaxies. These two galaxies uh, resemble spiral galaxies. They're perhaps not so beautiful and elegant, but they have a nucleus and they have blue uh, disk-like structures. And there are irregular galaxies. We do see irregular galaxies today, but they're not as common as they seem to be 
at early times. If we go to when the universe was only one to two billion years old, the situation transforms. We don't see the regular galaxies that we see today. Many of them have multiple components, as if they're coalescing, and they're physically much smaller uh, than they are uh, today. So Hubble and telescopes like Keck have come up with a, a, a consistent picture of how galaxies have grown over 90% of cosmic history. That's not to say there aren't still, of course, remaining puzzles. But the focus of my talk today is to go even further back uh, to when galaxies emerge from darkness. And that's what we mean by cosmic dawn. Cosmic dawn is not the beginning of the universe. It's not the Big Bang, but it is when the universe was first bathed in starlight. So how does this work? Well, this is obviously a cartoon. Time is running from left to right. Here's the Big Bang. And the glow of the Big Bang is seen today in an all sky signal at microwave rate uh, frequencies or wavelengths, uh, but there are no stars. And as the universe expands, it cools. And these dark hydrogen clouds uh, are clumping under gravity. They eventually collapse. And as they collapse, they get hot in their centers and stars are born. They burn their nuclear fuel and shine and the universe is bathed in starlight for the first time. We call this moment cosmic dawn. We, we haven't witnessed it. We hope that James Webb will witness it. And these baby galaxies are uh, very, very hot. And the reason they're hotter than the stars that we see in the Milky Way is they don't have the heavy elements that make up you and me. They're only made, these early stars are only made of hydrogen and helium, which are the only elements, light elements, with a couple more that are produced in the Big Bang. So there's no carbon, there's no oxygen, there's no silicon, there's no iron. These stars are very hot and they can break up the hydrogen in deep space. They can separate the proton and the electron and they create these gigantic ionized bubbles, which eventually expand and become more frequent and merge. And this is what we call cosmic reionization, the transformation of hydrogen in deep space into an ionized gas. Well, we're not gonna talk about reionization too much today, but here's a, here's a movie, a theoretical simulation of reionization. The expansion of the universe has been taken out in this universe. So it's a rotating box of space. And the ionized bubbles are these blue regions. And the dark regions are the, are the hydrogen gas, which has not yet been ionized. And as time goes on, a little bit like Swiss cheese, these ionized bubbles connect. And eventually the universe becomes completely ionized. Just an amusing remark, you know, we always live in a world with theoreticians, they have no need for observations. Um, this is a, obviously an idealized model of what actually happens. It uh, takes about 500 million years, this process. So this is, I like this figure, this is the history of the most distant known object as a function of the publication date in years at the bottom here. So when I was a student in the 1960s, the most distant galaxy had a redshift of 0 0.5, whereas quasars had been discovered right here at the, at the 200 inch. And Martin Schmidt and others were finding quasars at redshifts of up to four. Now, it's very sad news that Martin Schmidt died exactly a week ago. Um, and uh, of course, he was a, a gigantic figure at Caltech. But look at the progress that's been made since those early pioneering days with the 200 inch. So today, the most distant object is a galaxy at a redshift of 11, seen when the universe was only. Um, 
about uh, three, five percent, four percent of its uh, of its present age. So this is a you know the growth, this growth in finding the most distant object is a combination of more powerful telescopes, obviously, like the Keck, the Hubble, the Very Large Telescope, but it's also advances in instrumentation, better detectors, uh, CCD cameras, infrared detectors, and so forth. Well, this slide I prepared in uh, April, and it's out of date. It's out of date already. In the space of only two months, James Webb has pushed this frontier back as I will explain. Now, how do we define these distant galaxies? Well, you might think that the most distant galaxies are the faintest, but lum you know, the brightness on the sky is a very, very poor way to find the most distant galaxies because galaxies span an enormous range of luminosity. So just like you wouldn't estimate the distance to a light by assuming it's a street light uh, or a car headlight uh, in the darkness, because you know that you know the luminosity might be quite different for certain objects, like for instance a lighthouse. Um, so it is with galaxies. So the trick, which was pioneered by a professor at Caltech, Steidel, Chuck Steidel, uh, exploits the fact that hydrogen in deep space absorbs uh, the light from a galaxy at a particular ultraviolet wavelength, and so the galaxy that is most distant. Uh, drops out in the shortest wavelength filter because of its uh, because of its redshift, and you can see in this picture taken at Palomar actually, this is a picture of a red part of the uh, a part of the sky taken in a red filter, a green filter, and an ultraviolet filter, <coughs> and you can see many of the galaxies are present in all of these filters, but this one here that's circled in blue. Uh, disappears. And the reason it's disappeared is it's been redshifted and that hydrogen absorption has entered this particular filter. So this explains uh, how it works in practice. These are all the filters from the visible to the near infrared on Hubble Space Telescope. And this little simulated movie shows you how as the redshift increases, the galaxy disappears in progressively redder filters because of the expansion of the universe. So all you have to do is determine at which filter the galaxy disappears. And that tells you at least approximately uh, how far away it is and at what epoch in cosmic history uh, you're observing it. Now, a little bit about observing. You know, most of you are observers, uh, you know the thrill of observing an object. Let me tell you, there's nothing more exciting uh, than making a discovery on a telescope uh, in real time. These are some of my uh, former students. Uh, and you know, here's one observing at the Keck telescope uh, directly. Uh, and in many cases, you know, we make fantastic discoveries. We got on the front cover of Time magazine in 2006. Uh, with discoveries of distant objects. But sometimes there are cloudy nights and, you know, students get very depressed on a cloudy night. Here's a cloudy night photograph. This student is cheerful. His thesis just finished his thesis. He doesn't worry. Everything's going well. This guy's Italian. Oh, the Italians, they're always happy. And this guy who looks despondent you know, his thesis is going down the drain because he's just sat there for four nights at the Keck telescope and, uh, you know, no data at all. And my job at that time is, you know, to cheer people up. That's what I do. It's uh, my job as a professor. So I buy the pizza and the bottles of wine. And I think that's why this photograph is slightly blurred, actually. OK, so uh, so what? Let's move to the frontier then. So what, what exactly are the questions that we're asking with James Webb? I've told you what Cosmic Dawn is. It's the emergence of, of, it's really the emergence of starlight. What could be more profound? We are made of stardust. So we're looking at our origin. 
Um, can we witness it? Can we look back far enough to see galaxies emerging from darkness? Was it a gradual event or was it a dramatic event? Did, you know, did the universe suddenly switch on? Um, so how far did we get with Hubble? Well, we took the deepest image in 2012 called the ultra deep field. Astronomy is full of superlatives. You know, there's the very large telescope and then there's, there's the extremely large telescope, which was a D scope of the overwhelmingly large telescope. Um, so there was the deep field and then this is the ultra deep field. So the ultra deep field uh, was two weeks of exposure uh, taken with the uh, wide field camera three on board the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and here's our team. It was a collaboration between my team at Caltech and this guy here, Professor Dunlop at the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh here. This is the image. And we found galaxies out to redshifts uh, beyond seven and a half, all the way up to about 10 or so. So that's one way of using Hubble, you just, you know, it's sort of mindless, really. You just point it at a blank bit of sky, you know, and just expose for an enormously long time. Uh, there is a, another way, and that is uh, illustrated in that opening slide I showed you with President Biden's picture from the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, no guesses for who this guy is. Um, Actually, a few years ago, my wife gave me an Einstein calendar. Every, you know, every month there was a picture of Einstein doing something different. You know, Einstein at the blackboard, Einstein on a bicycle. By the time it got to April, I realized he only had one suit. It was always the same suit in all the photographs. OK, so Einstein predicted that light is actually bent by massive objects. Now, how can that be? Well, if you think about it, Newton puzzled greatly why the Earth goes around the sun. How does the Earth know that the sun is there? Yes, of course, there's a gravitational force. But how does that force transmit itself over a distance? Newton was very worried about this. You know, what's the mechanism by which the gravitational force transmits itself? And um, the answer is that space is a fabric and the sun distorts that fabric and the earth follows a trajectory that is permitted by that distortion of space and the prediction of einstein was that light would also be distorted by space and it could be tested at the time of an eclipse so at the time of an eclipse, the stars that you see would not be in the same position as they would when the sun is not in the way. And this was a triumphant discovery uh, led by this man, Sir Arthur Eddington at Cambridge. Um, and, you know, we, we can exploit this technique um, not by pointing the Hubble or Keck telescope at the sun, but by pointing at other regions of the sky where there is a huge assembly of massive, massive material, such as a cluster of galaxies. And uh, two things happen. Uh, if the alignment is very good, then you magnify the background object. You actually are using this as a telephoto lens in addition to your telescope. You, you're enhancing the power of your telescope. And you can, in principle, occasionally see objects in different locations, like a mirage. So here's one of the earliest images that we analyzed with Hubble in the 90s when I was still in the UK. And you can see here's the cluster of galaxies. Here's the giant galaxy in the center. And if you look at these funny little trio of objects that are here, here, and here, they have this, each one of them has this sort of hook shape. They are three images of the same object. The light has been bent and has reached the telescope by three different routes. And uh, so this technique has been harnessed. Here's a simulation of how dark a dark object would lens 
and distort background objects. And you can see occasionally you get these gigantically highly magnified images. So a few years ago, at 2017, Hubble pointed at six of these clusters and found large numbers of distorted background objects. I was not involved in, in this work. And this is a second technique for looking as deep as possible with Hubble. You're harnessing the magnifying power of these clusters. So this is what came out. This is the ultimate sort of achievement of looking back in time with Hubble. This is the density of galaxies on a logarithmic scale. This is redshift, or if you prefer, the age of the universe at that time. And so you can see the numbers are declining. And there's some evidence uh, that it's declining very rapidly out here at redshift 10. This is about as far as Hubble can see. And so this gentleman here, Pascal Osh at the University of Geneva, Swiss, Switzerland, you know, he was predicting cosmic dawn would be around a redshift of 12 to 13 when the universe is about 300 million years old. But there's always controversy. This Scotsman, Derek McLeod at Edinburgh, suggested that it's decaying more slowly. And so cosmic dawn might be beyond the, um, the, uh, the edge of this particular plot, maybe at redshift of 15 or so. This is out of date already. James Webb has transformed our understanding and resolved this puzzle in only two months since uh, operation, scientific operations began. And I'll tell you why and how in a moment. So one final piece, if you can't look back enough to see the birth of a galaxy, here's again, the number of galaxies plotted as a function of redshift. What if you could take an individual galaxy and try to estimate how old it is? The analogy would be you walk down the street, you meet a four-year-old child. You weren't present at the birth of that child. But if you can determine that that child is four years old, then you know that he was around four years ago. So here's exactly the same story. We go to this galaxy seen when the universe was 500 million years old. We ask, how old is it? How old are the stars in it? And therefore, when did it form? We can't witness with Hubble it, the formation of objects like that, but at least we can estimate and try to tell the difference between these two very different pictures. So how do you measure the age of star of a population of stars? Well, you probably know stars have different masses. The sun is a typical star, but there are giant stars like Rigel, and Betelgeuse, there are dwarf stars. Um, and so they have different ages and they have different amounts of hydrogen. And so um, a stellar population ages as a function uh, of its mass. And uh, so these, it produces this hydrogen absorption, which we call the Balmer absorption. And you can see in this picture that it's a very good age indicator. The strength of this Balmer break, which is in the visible part of the spectrum, can distinguish stars that are 20 million years old from a population of stars that are 500 million years old. So here's this galaxy that I chose, this one here at a, approximately at a redshift of nine, and its energy spectrum does seem to show this uh, strong break suggesting that it's a very old galaxy already at this early time. But unfortunately, it turns out that uh, there's this annoying uh, strong emission line of oxygen, which could be polluting this particular filter, which was taken with the Spitzer Space Telescope. <coughs> and this has been a huge problem in astronomy to separate these galaxies are very, very faint. We can't see these lines directly. We have to infer their presence. So here's the Spitzer data, and you can see it's a, it's a very strong signal here. And here's the Hubble data. And the only way that we could resolve this ambiguity between the contribution, this, the reason this is so bright, 
is due to old stars or is it due to this strong oxygen line would be to get its redshift very, very precisely. If the redshift is greater than nine, then this line moves out of the Spitzer filter. And sure enough, at the Very Large Telescope, uh, we found this object is beyond a redshift of nine. It's, it's uh, this object here, it's slightly gravitationally lensed. And here is the, the key measurement. This is an oxygen line and this is a hydrogen line. And here is our team at the uh, Paranal at the observatory in Chile. So what this means is that this break here is indeed due to starlight and it gives us an age of 290 million years. And so it must have been around at an even earlier time when the universe was only 250 million years old. So that was one trick for finding. Now, you know, so going back to the controversy here, so the Swiss guy would have said, oh my gosh, you know, there's a galaxy here that formed way out here at redshift of 15, uh, but he could quite rightly argue that, you know, well, this may be a special object. And so uh, the key question is whether this galaxy was typical. Well, we did six other, we did six objects in total. Uh, and just before the launch of James Webb, this is what we found, that they, don't all, they didn't all form at the same time. They formed at a range uh, from when the universe was 250 to 450 million years old, uh, between a redshift of 11 and six. And we calculated that they would be detectable at cosmic dawn with the James Webb Space Telescope, galaxies like them. Okay, so here we are. The James Webb Space Telescope era has finally arrived. I was really privileged um, literally just before the pandemic in February 2020 to go to El de Segundo in Los Angeles to Lockheed Martin and see the monster uh, there. Here's a human, just to give you an idea of the scale. There are 18 mirror segments. Each segment is 1.3 meters across. It is a six and a half uh, meter telescope. It has something like um, six and a half times the power of the Hubble Space Telescope in aperture, four times better resolution. These mirrors are very lightweight. They're made of a material called beryllium, very one of the lightest elements. Uh, they're gold coated because gold is a very, very accurate reflecting surface, unlike al aluminum. In 1996, um, and I think this is a, a good indicator of the ambition of American science, Hubble had just been launched in 1990. It had been re repaired in 1993. As in 1994, I was invited to serve on a committee to plan the next big thing. Only one year after the successful repair of Hubble Space Telescope, we wrote a report called HST and Beyond. Uh, I was the only European, I was in Europe at the time, I was the only European on this committee. Uh, and it recommended the construction of what became uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, just like Hubble, James Webb had a rocky ride. It was originally gonna be a $1 billion telescope. It turned out to be a $10 billion telescope. Uh, it was nearly canceled, just like Hubble, uh, several times. Um, it's was original launch date was going to be uh, 2009. And, uh, you know, if you plotted a graph of the predicted launch date with time, uh, a skeptic might say, you know, might never be launched or maybe 2030 or something. But fortunately, uh, it was launched, as you know, last year. Um, it is a very innovative uh, telescope. Let's go back. Um, it has um, these, uh, this solar shield, which is made of five layers uh, coated with aluminum uh, that are 20 meters by 14 meters, size of a tennis court, um, that uh, 
can be deployed to keep the telescope operating at 50 degrees above absolute zero. That is because it is primarily an infrared telescope. Some people say James Webb is the replacement or the successor to Hubble. It's not really true because Hubble is primarily an optical telescope. James Webb is really a near infrared and mid infrared telescope. So James Webb is more like a replacement or a successor to the Spitzer Space Telescope. Now imagine your anguish when you see the whole thing being hoisted by this crane, you know, and carried into the um, nose cone of the Ariane space rocket. One tiny hiccup here, you know, and uh, 10 million bucks goes down the drain. Um, the launch was there. One of my students, um, another Italian, managed to sweet talk himself into the control room. I don't know how he did this. I think he got on his knees and said, you know, this is going to be this, the future of career of, of my life, you know, working with this telescope. And he was actually witnessed the launch in um, Guyana in South America, a uh, French, French uh, colony. Here's the launch on Christmas Day. I'm sure we all, well, it was great for, for us in the UK. We could have our Christmas lunch. And then after lunch, watch the launch of Space Telescope. The only thing was I was absolutely shit scared, you know, because one big problem and then the whole of my future career would go up in smoke. This is the last we will see of James Webb. You, we will not be able to visit it. And so, that, you know, the launch was just the beginning of an anguishing period where, you know, the, uh, the solar shield was deployed. Um, the secondary mirror was deployed here. Uh, and then finally, the, the folded 18 uh, segments uh, were fully deployed. And then finally, each image, four different instruments, a camera, a spectrograph, uh, another spectrograph, and a mid-infrared imager and spectrograph uh, were tested, and all of the images were sharp. Unlike Hubble, it doesn't orbit the Earth. Uh, it orbits the sun. It's in a position um, beyond the moon at a point called the Lagrangian point. So let me explain what that is. So this is the sun, this is the earth, and uh, 1.3 million kilometers away is uh, James Webb orbiting a little, it has to orbit a little bit so that it can avoid the earth and the moon um, in this point here. Now the significance of this point here, L2, is that at that point, the gravitational pull of the Earth matches that of the Sun. So the Earth is moving around the Sun at a certain speed. Normally, an object further away uh, than the Earth uh, from the Sun would be going around the Sun more slowly. You know that Pluto goes around the Sun much more slowly than the Earth. So if you just sent it to a, an, an arbitrary point in space, it would be very far away. It would eventually get further and further away from the Earth. And so communications with it would have a delay of many minutes. And that would be you know, terrible for controlling the instruments on board. So um, the advantage of putting it at L2 is that it tracks the Earth going around the sun directly. Um, the combined gravitational force of the sun on the Earth is enhanced by the contribution from the Earth uh, so that at L2, it sees exactly the same gravitational force from the Sun and the Earth as the Earth does uh, from, uh, from the Sun. So it always stays locked with the, with the Earth as, as the Earth rotates around, meaning it's uh, very easy and quick to communicate with it. Well, I want to finish um, uh, to allow time for questions. So let me uh, tell you what are the first science results. And I've got three uh, basic um, themes. Um, I'm focusing on early galaxies. I'm not talking about exoplanets, which is not my area of speciality. Um, so the first is this question of how many galaxies are there beyond uh, the horizon that was achievable with Hubble. The second uh, that some of you may have heard is, is there a crisis 
Uh, did Hubble find galaxies? Uh, did James Webb find galaxies that mean that we have to rethink our cosmological model? And finally, um, James Webb is the first real space telescope that has high quality uh, spectrographs on it. Hubble has some spectrographs, but James Webb has uh, multi object spectrographs um, that allow us to measure the chemistry of the gas in early galaxies. Uh, so I'll tell you about that too. So I'll go through these three points. So I, I remember this slide, the conundrum. This is the limit that Hubble can see. And there's controversy about what's out there at earlier times. So this is the first result. These are all the galaxies, uh, the luminosity plotted on the y-axis uh, that have been found in only the first images from James Webb. So in the space of only a month, galaxies have been claimed to exist out to redshifts of at least 16 or so. <coughs> and this uh, controversial curve, which you know, showed that the, the Swiss guy who predicted it declines, you know, looks like uh, we were right. And there are galaxies out, uh, out to redshifts of 15 in abundance. Now, not everybody agrees. And let me tell you that there's some, as always in the first data sets, there's some controversy. Um, and that is this idea of estimating the redshift from these colors. Remember the idea of, you know, the color filters and everything. Um, here's an example of a galaxy that could be at a redshift of 10. Here's the data in red. And the blue is a fit at a redshift of 10. But a green is a redshift at a fit of 2. And it's certainly true that the, the, the redshift 10 fit is better but not by very much. So, you know, there are some galaxies where Professor X says it's a very high redshift galaxy and Professor Y says it's not at that redshift. And this has occurred for the most distant one, the new, the most distant object so far that James Webb has, is possibly at a redshift of 16, when the universe is only 1%, 1.7% of its present age. Um, and this is from the Edinburgh group. Uh, but the Harvard group has argued that, you know, the data can be fitted just as well with a redshift of 4.8. So, you know, the data is still settling down. People are still arguing. Uh, but there are so many of these objects, and some of them are very robust, that I think it's pretty, uh, you know, I would put my money on that there are many galaxies out here beyond uh, the horizon that we saw. Uh, with um, James Webb, with Hubble rather. Okay, second point was, um, you know, is there a problem with our model of the universe? So um, the surprising, some um, this group in uh, Australia uh, claimed that some galaxies are so massive at these early times at redshifts of seven and even ten uh, that the theorists can't explain them. Uh, how can that be? Um, there's not enough material associated uh, at early times that has clumped to make galaxies as massive as the, the ones that are found. Uh, this paper by the group in Melbourne claims some of these objects are more massive than the Milky Way. It seems unbelievable that at the early times the universe has had in only a few hundred million years enough time to create a supermassive galaxy bigger than the Milky Way? Well, the answer is that these masses are very unreliable. Uh, we don't have um, you know, kinematics. We haven't got any rotation curves or anything like that. All we're doing is analyzing the images in different filters. And uh, the group in Arizona took one of these uh, distant objects, this one, I think, and showed that with a bit of manipulation, you could, reduce, you could reduce its mass by a factor of 40. So again, you know, the dust is still settling uh, on some of these early results. That's not to say that the data isn't absolutely fantastic. It's just people are rushing into print, perhaps a little bit too quickly. So let's finally think about chemistry. So 
I haven't talked at all about chemistry, except, of course, I told you that in the Big Bang, we only produce the light elements, hydrogen, helium, lithium, uh, and so forth. Um, most of the, uh, of the heavier elements, carbon, silicon, iron, nickel, are synthesized in stars. And they're produced uh, and, and generated by supernovae that expel these uh, heavy elements into space. And then, of course, that material is then available for the next generation of stars. So you must imagine that these heavy elements, oxygen and so forth, uh, are not present at cosmic dawn. And then as the universe ages and stars uh, explode and supernova form, then of course that oxygen enrichment grows with time. So James Webb is the first telescope in space that allows us to make the chemical composition measurements at these very early times. Here's a spectrum from James Webb, which just is so beautiful. Uh, at a redshift of 7.7, .7, you see these beautiful lines of oxygen, hydrogen, helium, neon, that enable us to measure the composition, the chemical composition of the gas in a galaxy that's only five or 600 million years after the Big Bang. This is what a, such a spectrum looks like with Keck. So, you know, it's, it's completely transforming chemistry uh, of the early universe. So the Holy Grail, you know, if I could uh, sort of get to the end, the Holy Grail would be to see a galaxy that has none of these heavy elements in. That would be a pristine galaxy that has not yet even uh, had any supernovae. And um, it's going to be very difficult because it's a very short period of time before supernova uh, explode, maybe only five million years for the most massive stars. Um, but, you know, so there are these undoubtedly these challenges, but I'm, on, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an optimist because all of these telescopes that we've built, 200 inch Keck, Hubble, Spitzer, have done so much better than we ever predicted. They've always done more science than we use to justify their funding. And I'm sure that's gonna be the case for the James Webb Space Telescope. Thank you very much. Professor Richard Ellis, thank you. Thank you very much. And if you like this, if you like this story, read my book. Um, it's coming out in uh, 8th of November. You can order it now on Amazon. Um, and it goes through the whole history of this subject. There's an entire chapter on Palomar, the work of Professor Sandage, Professor Gunn, and many others. Thank you. And, th and thank you. I mean, thank you for this marvelous exhibition of your quest, well, perhaps our quest, to extend our vision and broaden our understanding of the universe and in effect of ourselves. Exactly. With, with that, let me open the floor for questions. We have a couple of questions in the chat and we will pick those up. But uh, let, me, let me ask, let me ask, anybody has questions? I can see the chat, I think, if I... Uh... Yes, down at the bottom. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, I see a question from Javier. Uh, is time linear? Uh, it, it, it is, yeah. I mean, even in Einstein's theory, time is linear, except, you know, it's perceived at different rates when you get close to a black hole. So it depends who the observer is. Uh, when we talk about the universe, um, on large scales, which is what we're really talking about when we're looking at cosmic dawn, then time is linear. The only complication uh, in terms of where, you know, where, where time gets sped up is when there's, uh, you know, there's a clock, say, falling close to a black hole and an observer witnessing that from a different standpoint. So relativity is very complicated when you get into dense environments, but the universe as a whole fortunately is a very simple, um, the, the physics of, of space time is relatively simple.
I don't see questions. Any Anybody, questions. please. So, Richard, what's your uh, impression of the observatory since uh, the decade plus time, linear time has expanded since your directorship? Oh, Palomar, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I was, uh, of course, had an opportunity to look at Palomar um, and discuss its in current instrumentation project uh, last night with the superintendent, Rick Burroughs. And I was uh, very, very impressed. And by the way, Richard, that's me asking the question. I know, I know. I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to uh, make it uh, appear that you're not. <laughs> um, you know, it's not a planted question. This is an honest reply from a former director. It is, um, it is truly amazing. I mean, um, this telescope, you know, uh, is my favorite by by a long shot and uh it's obviously nostalgic as i mentioned to come back and observe with it but um um you know what's so gratifying is telescopes keep reinventing themselves you know there's no such thing as a stagnant telescope so long as the community is engaged and that's really what has happened um over the last 15 years since uh, i was director Firstly, with Professor Kulkarni, who took over as director after me, he had a vision of the mountain as a gigantic synergistic uh, time domain factory for looking at variable objects, things that go pop. Uh, and that area of science has truly exploded and led to all kinds of uh, discoveries uh, unimaginable uh, 20 years ago. And now, um, uh, as Rick mentioned to me last night, we have several uh, faculty at Caltech who, are, who I remember were arriving as I left Caltech, and they've been amazingly productive in uh, developing new instruments and, of course, raising money, which, of course, is the history of the observatory as well. So the place is abuzz with new projects, and that's exactly how it should be. Um, and let me tell you, not every observatory um, manages that. There are many observatories uh, that have become stagnant. Um, and there's this feeling that, you know, as telescopes get bigger, uh, the lesser the, the lesser aperture ones, the ones with smaller apertures uh, tend to just be mothballed. And that's the exact opposite of what's happened here at Palomar. So I think congratulations to Rick and his staff, but particularly to the vitality of the department at uh, Caltech. So there's a few more questions here. Martin Rees, oh gosh, uh, yes. Martin Rees speaks of the Orborus model of the universe. Yes, so, well, I have a lot of trouble with Martin Rees. Um, and he and I, of course, were together in Cambridge for seven years. I, uh, he, his famous chair, he moved sideways in 1993 and I was appointed to it uh, and we couldn't be more different. He's a brilliant theoretician um, and it's an unfortunate fact we have to live in a world with theoreticians um, and I'm an observer. <laughs> Martin Rees has written uh, elegantly about the, um, the multiverse, um, you know, that we are just one universe with a particular set of physical constants um, and there could be, you know, a whole plethora of other, other universes. And for me, um, to be blunt, this is, you know, just idle speculation because we will never have the opportunity uh, to observe. <coughs> and I've had it out with Martin on this many times um, in his garden, um, you know, and his analogy is that um, our knowledge of physics is incomplete and just like um, primitive man looking out at the ocean uh, and only seeing, you know, a few miles and wondering whether there's anything out there. Uh, and then, you know, somehow inventing a boat and going out and discovering America, you know, um, that that analogy applies to um, our narrow view that the universe is only one, our universe. Uh, but unless the laws of physics are completely uh, thrown away, I just don't see any way of verifying <clears throat> the idea. So I know that they have, um, they induce excitement in readers. Readers love 
this kind of speculation and it's great you know for stretching the imagination but for those of us at the coal face doing the observations you know um it's just a distraction frankly so i don't know if that uh, rather blunt reply Pat patrick is it um um disappoints you um maybe you're a big fan of um oh no it wasn't patrick sorry it was tom yeah patrick has a question uh i had a follow-up on that um i was just wondering i i too see martin as a, a theoretician but i'm just wondering if the as the web telescope is going to provide any data that would relate to the earliest days and no. his theory of the micro and the macro interacting well uh, the, the is that tom speaking is it yes that's tom yes okay i can't see who's speaking um so uh tom i think the 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 only hope would be a feature in the glow from the big bang watch what we call the cosmic white microwave background that would show some structure that would indicate some sort of percolation with another universe and even that is sheer conjecture but there's james webb is a small scale telescope that doesn't probe large angles on the sky which would be needed to see you know any signature of connections or you know relics of connections with other universes so james webb is not going to address that um, point there's a question in the room here, so I'll take that. I don't know if I'll relay it when I hear it. Yeah, I, I'm muted. Oh, uh, so uh, these high redshift galaxies that you can see with James Webb, right? These would be the cosmic web. Are they in filaments or nodes, or does that really matter? Uh, the question is, um, you know, where do these high redshift galaxies sit? in what we call the cosmic web so let me explain the cosmic web is the distribution of dark matter i haven't had time uh, to introduce dark matter but it is a, a key ingredient of the universe as you probably know um, the answer is that all of these galaxies that we see at early times are by virtue of the fact we're looking at the most distant ones we only see the most luminous examples and they are generally thought to be at the nodes of these cosmic webs uh, we can't see the cosmic web directly at these early times there are techniques for making maps of the cosmic web at lower redshifts and always we find that the massive galaxies are at the nodes of the cosmic web okay so we have a question from patrick um, there have been reports of damage from micrometeorites. Are you worried? Yes, I am a little. You know, um, the micrometeorite hit before uh, the operation, science operation began. I can't remember, was it April or May? Uh, and to the outermost uh, segment. And um, the claim is that it didn't damage the performance of the <coughs> telescope unduly. Uh, I was shocked that it happened so quickly in time, you know, that within only three months, uh, we had one of these events. The answer is we don't know very well the mass distribution of meteorites at these minute scales. It, we imagine it's probably some power law that as you go to smaller and smaller uh, micrometeorites, the numbers increase dramatically because of course the, you know, they, 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 they're broken up um in 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 their travel through the solar system and so forth so we don't have an ac accurate prediction <coughs> of how many there are and hence how often um so it's a fingers crossed exercise um there hasn't been any further damage in the in the in the, in the remaining three months um the good news is the lifetime of james webb was originally five years uh, with a goal of 10 years, but because the Ariane launch was so successful uh, and so precise in directing JWST to the Lagrangian point, there's plenty of uh, fuel uh, for it to have um, a lifetime of as long as 15 years. So, you know, there's good news and bad news. Uh, well, there's good news and worrying news. The worrying news is we don't yet know the statistics 
of these uh, micrometeorites. But the good news is that it's going to be, you know, it's certainly going to be there longer than we thought. Because, um, you know, for astronomers, um, many of us got, we've got used to Hubble being permanent, you know. And I mean, you know, I was 40, 1990, when Hubble was launched, and it's still doing great stuff. Uh, and people kept saying, well, Richard, you've got to remember, James Webb is only five years. So you've got to get your act together and get your science done in that five years. And so there's this, been this mentality in the astronomical community that, you know, we've got to go for it really fast. It's not going to be there forever compared to Hubble, which is almost like, you know, the 200 inch, you know, it's available all the time. Right. Uh, but fortunately, it looks like uh, there's more. There's going to be much more time. Uh, with James Webb, 15 years, maybe even 20. I don't see any new questions, but I welcome them. Are you saying that people are rushing into print with inadequate and speculative data? Aren't there referees in the astronomical journals of different kinds? Who's talking? This? Is that Patrick? No, it's uh, Mike Burton. Oh, okay. Uh, Mike, is it okay? You yes. couldn't. Be, you couldn't be more correct, Mike. Um, there's. Um, there's. This is the the, the slightly negative uh, of 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 this last couple of months uh, from my point of view. Is there's a very big difference between an article that appears in a refereed scientific journal, and the quality of some of the articles. Not all of them, uh, that are being posted on the archive. You probably know that there's an archive that is unrefereed where teams are racing to make the discoveries ahead of other teams. And um, maybe naively, I decided personally that I would not join this rat race. So you won't find my name on any of these 50 papers uh, in the first uh, couple of months or so. Now, in my honest opinion, I would say a significant fraction, maybe 20 to 30% of these papers are really not well thought through. Um, and, <clears throat> uh, you know, that's disappointing. And, you know, there, there are some of them are truly uh, beautiful papers that will last the test of time. And um, not all of these 50 papers have been accepted for publication. And yet they're talked about in the community, uh, as I have done in my own talk today, as if the, you know, the results. So in my talk, as you probably gathered, I try to point out to you the controversy where, you know, person A says this and person B says this. So the dust is still settling. And um, I agree with you um, that this is the um, byproduct of what we call, um, you know, immediate access, public access to the data. So the first scientific programs were called early release science. And the condition for those early release science programs, which were competitive, was that the data would be public instantaneously. And uh, that has led to this rat race of especially young people, you know, wanting to nail their name to, you know, cosmic dawn, chemistry, you know, massive galaxies and so forth. And um, in my opinion, it would have been better to have allowed a bit more time um, and give proprietary access so that, you know, people could look at the data more carefully and come up with better scientific articles. It's a very difficult topic, I think. Um, and obviously, I have my own opinions on it. Um, let's see. Uh, Patrick, again, says, what comes after the James Webb? Well, uh, one question in the topic of my talk is, can we, you know, if we see the birth of, of, of galaxies, does that mean the birth of stars? Did, were there any stars that formed on their own, you know, before assemblies of stars in galaxies? And the, the jury is out on this. The theorists, some theorists believe that there might be an earlier epoch, um, maybe at a redshift of 25 or 30, where massive stars can form in isolation, maybe 500 times the mass of the sun. They would not be visible with James Webb, they're to be too faint, um, but they would have an effect on the hydrogen around them. So the answer to your question is the next big thing is what we call the square kilometer array, which is a radio interferometer split between Australia and South Africa. 
And that will look at not individual galaxies, but it'll look at hydrogen. It'll look at the hydrogen in deep space through a radio line at 21 centimeters. Um, and uh, that will probe the period before cosmic dawn. And that uh, square kilometer array is progressing nicely. Of course, uh, it had its own hiccups too, just like James Webb, uh, but that's coming next. Kathy, you mentioned that James Webb was being thought about as the Hubble was just getting started. Uh, oh, what's happening now? Yeah, okay, so it's a similar question. But uh, I think uh, Kathy is asking, you know, what are we scheming about now that isn't yet funded? And the answer is um, a, uh, a a a more a, a, a giant version of Hubble, uh, maybe a ten meter uh, optical ultraviolet telescope uh, that is mentioned in the National Academy Decadal Survey that was published last year. And uh, of course, that's not funded, and it's a, it would be a very ambitious project uh, that would probably not uh, be in operation until the late 1930s. Uh, Javier has a follow-up. What is it, Javier? Yes, thank you very much. I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around. I've been thinking how to ask the question properly to not confuse anybody or even myself. But I, I know the first image, I believe it was the very first image of kind of the deep galaxy or the deep universe that we looked at from the um, James Webb. It had arches on, uh, especially on the outer um, uh, uh, portions of the mirror. There were uh, arches, which my understanding is have to do with the gravitational and bending of light. Wow. So I guess my, my question is, is, is time really what we see from a perception or going back to time being linear, or or is it, is it indeed really linear? Because it's even bent, even the Earth, and obviously our Sun having uh, you know larger masses will bend it even further. So, what is the relationship between bending of time and light? My understanding is they 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 go hand in hand. So maybe you can clarify that for me. I'm I'm very intrigued in that. Okay. Um, the the answer is I think there's some confusion that the the bending of light uh, by massive objects is a geometrical effect. Um, it leads to different path lengths of light rays uh, than would be the case if the light wasn't bent. So if you think of a light ray, so it gets back to your question of linearity. If you think of light coming from a star to the Earth it travels linearly in space and time. If you think of the, um, the, the light ray being deflected by the sun, uh, the trajectory is slightly longer. So there's a delay. Um, and so there, you're right, there is an effect on time, but it's associated uh, with a longer path length that the light ray has taken uh, in going around the sun. Now in that image, and indeed in the universe generally, it's very, very rare indeed to find um, <coughs> what we call, you know, very strong lenses. That is where the effects of relativity are very, very large indeed. They occur when light is deflected around a black hole, but there the, the density of material is so great that we get into a different regime of Einstein's theory. But on the talk today, and in that image from Biden's cluster with the arcs and everything, the effects are absolutely minute and there's no uh, effect on time. It's perfectly rational to think of it as linear. So, you know, um, I see questions on black holes. Uh, I'm not an expert on black holes, but the, you know, for the talk today, um, the, the bending of light is primarily just a geometrical effect. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Richard, could, could I ask a question that's kind of follow up on some of these others? Um, you mentioned the HST and Beyond report, yeah. being on the committee that put that together. Um, how does the finished and commissioned telescope of 2022? Yeah. Telescope as it now stands out, out at L2. Mm. How does that telescope compare to the concepts and the vision of it 
that you had 27 uh, years ago? Oh, that is a very good question. So the question is, what did that report ask for? And it asked for a four meter telescope in space, um, an infrared four meter telescope. And the uh, chair of our committee was a Carnegie astronomer who you may know, uh, Alan Dressler. And Alan Dressler uh, did a brilliant job in assembling that report. Uh, Sri Kulkarni was a member of the committee along with me. Uh, Wendy Friedman, who was at Carnegie at the time was on it too, but I was the only European on the committee. Um, Alan then went to NASA um, and started giving talks on a four meter telescope in space, bigger than Hubble. And uh, the NASA chief of NASA administrator was uh, a very colorful guy called Dan Goldin. And Dan Goldin was one of these, um, you know, bravado Americans who, you know, nothing was impossible. And he basically told Dressler, why are you thinking so small? Why a four meter telescope? Why not make it a bigger one? Let's go for an eight meter. And of course, Dressler didn't know how to react to this. Here was the boss of NASA, who he had imagined would be worried about money, um, you know, saying that the committee had been, you know, not ambitious enough. And this guy Golden had a uh, had a had a had a motto: uh, faster, better, cheaper. And so he urged Dressler to come back uh, with a, 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 a eight meter telescope. And he said, oh, and you asked for a billion dollars. I'm sure we can do it for 500 million. So suddenly our report was whisked away from us. And, um, you know, suddenly we were faced with an eight meter telescope for 500 million, uh, which seemed, you know, crazy. And not surprisingly, by about 2001, uh, it was realized that, you know, this was unaffordable. An eight meter was unaffordable. It was descoped to a six and a half meter, which it is now. And it was um, it was then, I think, two billion. And uh, you know, as as always happens, it went up to four billion and six billion and eight billion, and here we are at ten billion. And well, at least it's working, you know. So, <laughs> and it seems to be working very well. Uh, it actually, I should have said that. Um, um, although it's slightly annoying that there are these controversies and uh, that, you know, people we've been discussing about some of the papers being a bit rushed, uh, the data is not only fantastic, but the some of the spectrographs and the cameras are performing better than we expected, which is which is not always the case in space missions. Tremendous. All right. You mentioned that the um, that the holy grail was to find pristine galaxies at great distances. Yeah. Are there pristine galaxies at closer distances, which are only helium and hydrogen? Um, yes, that is, uh, people have looked for pristine objects or pristine gas clouds at lower redshifts. And there, there have been some claims and uh, the, um, the theorists tell us that indeed it is possible as gas clouds continue to collapse and form young galaxies at later times uh, that, you know, these pristine objects would not all be at the, at the greatest distance. Some of them might be, you know, at intermediate redshifts and therefore accessible. Uh, so you're right that there could be pristine objects at lower redshift, but the, you know, the ultimate goal of the James Webb is to find the beginning of galaxies and that's uh you know that's what what i've talked about today but you're right there could be pristine objects at intermediate redshifts wouldn't wouldn't studying these nearby pristine galaxies help you find some of the very distant cosmic dawn galaxies well i think we know how to find them um it, the question is you know where are they and how far back in time do we have to probe the technique um through spectroscopy of looking uh, to see how many heavy elements and uh, you know how, how pristine they are is well established. So the community knows what to do. We've got the technology for finding them um, in terms of redshift. We then have to follow them up spectroscopically. So I, don't, I think it's 
it, the strategy um, has been laid out in many observing proposals. Um, finding examples at lower redshift will of course help. If, for example, if we knew how many there are, it might tell us the process by which enrichment occurs. So if you remember, I said that one of the dangers in looking for these pristine objects is it's a bit like a needle in a haystack because the time interval where the galaxy remains pristine is maybe only five million years or so. Now, um, we could find objects at lower redshift, but that, you know, maybe it would give us an indication of how accurate that five million year window would be. Uh, so you're right, there's, there's possible, there are possible lessons to be learned in finding them at lower redshift. Um, the, the reason people have been trying to find them at lower redshift is largely with current facilities, that is not James Webb, and it's been very, very difficult, I have to say. Well, Professor Ellis, it's a wonderful presentation, and you've been very, very generous with your time. Thank you very much. I, I do think we need to wind the meeting down. Um, and I'm, I, I greatly appreciate that you could be here today. Okay, thank you. It's been great fun and uh, nice to be back at Palomar. <laughs>